Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to another broadcast here on live stream Omega Ministries broadcasting live every Sunday afternoon, 1.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Hopefully everybody's doing well and life is treating you well and you've had a good week thus far. We want to get going here today, trying to cover more information that will hopefully lend itself to your edification, exhortation, and comfort and your growth in the Lord Jesus Christ. The goal is to see people grow and mature in Christ and become fruitful and, and productive in the kingdom of God. That's the goal of the gospel. <clears throat> not to try to hinder you, not to try to bind you, and not to try to discourage you in any way, shape, form, or fashion. What we do is we look for the nuances and the devices of the devil with the goal being to actually extract them from your life, leaving you whole and able to live the Christian life, allowing God to flow his power through you to reach others. That's the goal of the gospel. Before we get going here, let's uh, read Psalm 150 today. Psalm 150 says, praise ye the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in the firmament of his power. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the psaltery and harp. Praise him with the timbrel and dance. Praise him with stringed instruments and organs. Praise him upon the loud cymbals. Praise him upon the high sounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. So everything, every musical instrument designed to praise the Lord, that's what it's for. So if you belong to a church that tells you not to play music in church, read them Psalm 150 and tell them they're wrong. I think it's the Church of Christ that says you can't play music in church. Well, according to Psalm 150 in God's holy word, you can, and the instruments are used to praise him. Don't let anybody bind you. I mean, you've been in this thing too long. You've been alive too long to be bound. The goal is freedom at all costs. All right, but we have announcements. We have, we're all, always telling you about books to read. Right now, we're telling you about three different books mainly. The first one being Leadership is Male by David Paulson. Leadership is Male by David Paulson. You can find this on Amazon.com. I think this one cost me $12. You might be able to find it lower. You might be able to find it Kindle Books or somewhere for, for, the, for cents on the dollar, a few cents on the dollar. But this one cost $12. From Amazon, Leadership is Male. Good book. Also, another good book by David Paulson. I don't have a copy of it. Is Once Saved, Always Saved with a question mark behind it. So remember also, you can find on Amazon.com the book Once Saved, Always Saved by David Paulson. The other book, War on the Saints. Jesse Penn Lewis with Evan Roberts, War on the Saints. It's a good book, good war, warfare book, warfare manual. Read it slow, take notes. Build yourself a war manual against the devil. Prayers to pray against him, binding him, launching a spiritual warfare against the spirit that's launched the spiritual warfare against you. War on the Saints, Jesse Penn Lewis, good book about the different different uh different governments of the devil his governing powers and how to assault them in order to set souls free as well as what the human has to do in order to get free and stay free you got to be honest you got to be truthful you got to be sincere about where you are in life at any particular time don't try to think yourself to be more than you are if you're bound tell god you're bound so he can set you free who wants to be a person walking around as a hypocrite your whole life trying to look like something that you're not war on the saints leadership is male and once saved always saved 
from the ministry here at Omega, The Jesus Cult, written by yours truly, me. The Jesus Cult, available on our website, www.omegaministries.org. What if your church, your religion, your faith, what you believe is really all appended to a cult? What if the Jesus you claim to serve is not the right one? You know, the Bible speaks of two different Jesuses. That's news to a lot of people. But you go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 4 and following, you find that the Bible speaks of another Jesus, another spirit, and another gospel. So there is another Jesus that can deceive you. The Bible says the devil becomes an angel of light and his ministers come forth as ministers of righteousness. The Jesus cult. Available at www.omegaministries.org. Order online. or And I think it's available at Amazon too. Uh, I don't know the cost on Amazon. You know, Amazon a lot of times was recycle books. And you can get them on the low low. But for a fresh, new, sparkling, brand new copy like this one, order at www.omegaministries.org. And these are available on our website. Also, we solicit your prayers concerning this book right here. Which this is the manuscript for it. And you can see it's already done. It's finished. The manuscript is complete. As a matter of fact, the, the covers have been finished. The ISBN number has been appended to it. The barcodes are on it. Everything is ready to go to print. We can send it to the printer right now to print the book. But it's all about money. This is called The Organic Gospel, written by myself and Maisha Hunter. The Organic Gospel. The mystery of the gospel and the fact that it's organic. It can be planted in a human and grown. The gospel displaces the old nature and then replaces the old nature with the new nature. The Bible speaks of these two natures in the book of Ephesians chapter 4. As the old man and the new man. It's an organic gospel. It has the power to come alive in you and grow out of you. It can change you. It can change the way you walk, the way you talk, the way you think, the way you perceive things. The gospel can change everything about you. The organic gospel. We solicit your prayers about publishing this book. We've shopped it to some of the major Christian publishers. And I won't even tell you all the responses you get from them as far as their, their desires to make money primarily as opposed to getting the gospel out there. I thought the primary purpose of every Christian was to get the gospel out there. But you find out real fast in religion that the primary purpose for religion is what? Making some money. How many readers do you have? How many followers do you have? If we publish your book... How many people can be expected to buy it? Hey, man, look, that's why you got a promotion department and a distribution distribution department. I don't know. Who cares? Get it out there. It's the gospel. But you know what happens? You get all kinds of lying spirits that they publish because they have an audience. Lies always have a bigger audience than the truth. So we're asking for God to open a door for publication. The Organic Gospel, written by myself and Maisha Hunter, depicting to the church how you can actually fast and pray your way into another life. See, fasting, what it does, it begins to deaden the old man while prayer lifts up the new man. So you aid in the process by self-denial. See, self-denial is logical. It's, to, it's designed to deny the old you so that the new you can organically grow up out of you. If you listen to the terminology in the Bible, it's all organic terminology. Jesus talked about in Matthew chapter 13, the sower sows the word. Then he says later in another scripture that the word comes forth like an ear of corn. You know, the shoot and the, and the full ear and the corn and all these things are about or, organic growth. Then he talks about tear sowed in the midst of the, of the wheat. And the, the weeds can choke off things. And he says that the seed can be choked off in you by the cares of this world. All this organic terminology appending itself to growth of another life 
And the gospel really develops in you and me like a baby develops in a womb. Goes through that period of conception, gestation, and finally manifestation of what was sown. If, if we understand this, we'll do what's necessary to tend to that growing organism in us, which is the nature of Jesus Christ. The organic gospel. This is why the devil fights it being published, because it turns you away from religion and turns you toward a new you coming out of organic manifestation and growth. And the devil doesn't like that. He doesn't want you to turn away from striving and trying and debating and trying to belong to a group. And see, all that stuff is just something to hinder your growth. You got to get back to the principles of bringing forth organic life. So remember that in your prayer time, just ask the Lord, just go to the Lord and say, Lord, make a way for the organic gospel to come forth. It's just that simple. You don't have to go do a lot of deep praying and all that, but you can anchor in a little fasting with your prayer to up the action and the power as we ask God to open doors now to bring this age to a culmination. It's time for the saints to join forces to actually preach the authentic gospel to the world. And the Bible says, and then this age shall come to an end. So it's all about bringing this age to a culmination because the gospel has gone forth around the world. Last couple of things here. Remember the conference here in Atlanta, May 22nd through the 25th of this year. The Army of God conference as we come together on one accord for praise and worship. Uh, the presentation of the word in an understandable fashion for you to get more knowledge and understanding leading to your wisdom needed to actually matriculate through this present evil world. You got to be wise as a serpent and as harmless as a dove to make it through this. So the Army of God conference is designed for the saints to get together on one accord to see us fellowship to see us uh, trained up in the ways of war necessary to win battles against the devil. It's about coming together as the body of Christ and the body of Christ is depicted in, in one uh, state in the Bible as an army. This is the army of God conference May 22nd through the 25th. Registration is open now at www.omegaministries.org. Last time I checked, I think it's about 10 people who have registered so far, but we're down now into the zone where it's time to register. You're looking at February now, the 8th is today. It was January 1st, about three hours ago. Time is flying by. Uh, February just has 28 days, so it's 20 days left in this month. And at that, and when we hit see March 1st hit, which is going to be on a Sunday too, I believe, at that point, we're looking at spring. So you're going to jump from the middle of winter to spring in a couple of weeks and then plow through March and it's conference time, April and May. So you got to be proactive and you got to get things done ahead of time. So register now, www.omegaministries.org, all the different um, buttons to click on and all the site navigation will lead you to the registration it's simple, it's easy, register, and then book your hotel rooms. We've got a special rate at the Renaissance Hotel, and the registration process will walk you right through the booking of the hotel rooms. So you can have your rooms booked and your registration paid for. The only thing left is your personal transportation into town, and it'll be on. So May 22nd through the 25th, get down to Atlanta, for the Army of God Conference. It's all about the body of Christ being reformatted and stood up according to the book of Ezekiel. Stood up as an army. It's time to see an army stand up to fight the devil. The devil is, he, he's got to be stopped. It's just that simple. If he's not stopped, the people are going to lose their minds because it's too much. Nobody can stand up against this onslaught, so the devil has to be stopped. And we got to see a new kind of a person stand up to stop this idiot. Everything we do, as far as the Armor of God conference, is based on Ezekiel chapter 37, the dry bones coming back to life again. This church world we live in now has been dried up. 
it's been religiousized and made into just a, basically just a denominational cult with no power. And folks just drift around the church. They get entertained. So it's, see, entertainment will stimulate excitement in you to make you feel good. It's like a uh, shot of um, high-level uh, 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 drugs, something to make you feel good, what we call a placebo. It'll pacify you on Sunday morning and Wednesday night, but the rest of your life will be drudgery. You know, but you get a shot of adrenaline. You get a little kick from the drugs you take on Sunday and Wednesday, and that placebo makes you feel better because you were entertained. You'll leave a concert feeling the same way or, or, or a football game where your team won or a, a, your we, a wedding where one of your relatives got married and you're feeling good because they got married or anything like that can, that can provide an emotional stimuli will make you feel the same way as religion does and you'll think that that's an anointing or the power of God when it was just an, an entertainment session. So you see the world is basically corrupting right before our very eyes while the church is being entertained. We got to break out of this. We got to change this. We got to reformat people for war as an army to fight the devil. That's what it's all about. Army of God Conference, May 22nd through the 25th. Register now, www.omegaministries.org and get your hotel reservations made. Next thing, remember the prayer line, 1-805-399-1000. 1-805-399-1000 access code is 409367 prayer has really dropped off a lot as far as participation because people get weary in prayer they can't sustain it they can't stay locked in in prayer they give up in prayer so we need prayer warriors people who can stand at the gate and war against the adversary it's a special kind of person that can pray and pray through one eight zero five three nine nine one thousand. Access code four zero nine three six seven. Every night, Monday through Saturday, nine o'clock Eastern Standard Time. The prayer line. Lastly, remember Dunamis Tabernacle. Our endeavor is to raise up a standing tabernacle that will be a refuge for people to come to as this thing begins to culminate. You got to save people, wash people, and prepare people to be a bride for the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a process they have to go through. You have to have a system designed to accommodate the changes and metamorphosis, metamorphosis necessary to prepare people to meet the Lord when he returns. Dunamis Tabernacle is based on Isaiah chapter 4 verse 6 which says and there shall be a tabernacle for a shadow in the in the daytime from the heat and a place of refuge and for a covert or a covering from storm and from rain so it's all about that's our scripture that defines dunamis tabernacle isaiah chapter 4 verse 6 a tabernacle a shadow in the daytime a covering from heat a refuge, a covering from storms and from rain, a place where you can find peace for your soul, for you to go through a metamorphosis to be changed into the image of Christ so that he might know you and you, know, you might know him. We want to see this place built on the basis of the word, prayer, praise, proclamation, preaching of the word and teaching of the word designed to change people to be ambassadors to go forth and do the job. It's not about another church to sit around people in theater style sitting, listen to sermons, sermons all day. It's the preparation of the individual to do the job themselves. See, the right mindset has to be had to come into church in this kind of environment. You got to know you're coming in here not to sit in the fourth grade all day, but you plan on graduating. I always use the example of college. Nobody goes to college intending to stay there for 35 years. Wouldn't it be stupid to go to college at 18 and at 63 you're still in college? That's kind of crazy. Nobody plans on staying in college that long. You go to college with a four-year program in mind that you're going to go through 
to complete it, graduate, to do what you were taught in college in a practical way. Practicum is application of the data you were taught. How can you sit in church all these years being taught something when you and never go through practical, practical application and experiencing it? Why keep reading about Jesus casting out devils, Jesus healing the sick, the exploits of the apostles and Stephen and uh, Philip the evangelist and Peter and James and John and Jude and all the rest of them. And they're just people just like you and me. It happened to them, but you never experienced it. That's These are New Testament people. How is it that Stephen and Philip the evangelist experientially went through the process and then did the job with supernatural attestation of what they they did. You came through the same process that they did. You got saved the same way. You process through the church and you get nothing. A, a dud. A dud. They had explosive ordinance and we're turning out duds. It's something it's, we got to backtrack. Hold it. Something is wrong. If I'm manufacturing warheads and every time I drop one, it doesn't explode, I got to go back to the manufacturing process. Did y'all put any TNT in here? Is the detonator installed? Is the timer operative? Have you guys, what, what's, we all drop, we've dropped 150 bombs and not one exploded. It must be something wrong with the manufacturing process. When I'm looking at Stephen and Philip tearing the, the, the world up, up and turning the world upside down and they're just like me and you, just a guy. How did they get this power flowing through them like a river and now we got just churches everywhere. Churches dot the landscapes everywhere. No power. That's impossible. Something is wrong. So my thing is, bring this truck to a screeching halt, hold it. We better look at reformatting the whole thing to get in a line, alignment with what they had in the book of Acts. Church order, church discipline, a governmental authority in place. If you read the book of Acts very carefully, everybody went out from under government authority sent forth. Paul and Barnabas did not go out helter-skelter. They were sent forth from the apostles with their blessing. Stephen came up through the ranks as a deacon. Philip the evangelist came up through the ranks as a deacon. Phoebe was a servant of the church. This is governmental authority and order in place. What we got now is wildfire burning. Everybody posting videos on YouTube. and in, You know how dangerous it is to be teaching and preaching and speaking on YouTube and making videos. And you're not even prepared to do what you're doing. You haven't been authorized by God to do it. He hasn't sent you to do it. You just thought it was a good idea. Five million problems in you and you're trying to export all those problems in a human way. What do I mean by that? See, people who have a lot of demonic problems, they try to talk the gospel and preach the gospel as if the demonic problems are normal and all of us are going through them. That's a bad situation right there, buddy, because now everybody's just doing what? Accepting the demonic problems they have is normal. And we're just trying to do the best we can. We're not teaching coping mechanisms. I'm not that Van Zant woman that walks around with Oprah trying to teach you how to cope. Jesus Christ will make you free. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. You have to be a vessel prepared for the master to use you. We got all these folks out here putting themselves in all kinds of danger, trying to do that which they are not called to do. They should leave that alone and stop trying to tell folks things that they're not living up to themselves. Because the devil is going to double back to see you. This is not a 
ministry, it is not a life built on emulation, trying to look like somebody else and trying to do what somebody else does. I got saved two weeks ago. Now I'm making videos. Leave that alone. Leave it alone. The Bible says, don't let there be many teachers amongst you and seeing that they'll receive the greater condemnation. You'll be held accountable for everything you do, but not only that, everything you say, but not only that, everything you live. You got to live what you do and say. This is not something you can do in a copycat fashion. Stop playing with this before you get your head ripped off because there's a real, real dragon lurking in the bushes over there and he will respond. And when he responds, you better have some firepower to stop that clown because he's coming after folks heavy. God's grace can be frustrated. The only thing that keeps a lot of folks doing this stuff is God's grace and mercy. But if you persist, you'll see the, the mercy and grace of God begin to back off of you to let you deal with the devil direct. And that's what most folk, they fold up like an old army tent because they didn't expect the devil to be able to do what he can do to you. It looks simple when somebody else does it that's called to do it. But man, when you jump out there trying to emulate, you're setting yourself up for an impending disaster. Heed the warning, stop, sit down, and go through the process. All right, that's it for the announcements. Remember, doing the Tabernacle, contributions can be made again at www.omegaministries.org. Hit support, followed by donate. Right now it's $24,000 and some change in the building fund. And we're waiting to see what's going to happen here in open door. I always talk about a game changer. All we need is one game changer. There may be one person listening today that can be a game changer. We launch. We destroy our assigned targets. <clears throat> Excuse me. We get out of here. We've found about five or six properties that would be good enough to accommodate us. A lot of them are bank-owned properties, <clears throat> so you can get them on the low low. The asking price is never the purchase price when you got a bank-owned property. So no matter what they say as far as what they're asking, that means nothing. So when well, we're looking for God to open up a door, we're not going to go out here on a limb and do a bunch of junk. Folks say, go run over here, rent this, rent. No, we need a clear, precise pathway to actually get a job done and get it done right. We're not fooling around with a bunch of stumble bomb, made up junk. It's time to see the body of Christ rise up in an orderly fashion, in a military alignment, to confront an enemy who stands in military array. The devil runs a strict, ordered military unit. They got commanders in place. They got principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places that report directly to Satan. This is an orderly army. They're, they are military. They have a, a strict code of military conduct they adhere to. They are seeking and destroying who they see as the enemy, which is you and me. And here we are, stumbling and bumbling around in darkness, not knowing what's going on, trying to figure it out as we go. No, we got to return to military structure. That's the only way to overcome this adversary. Read the book of Acts. Take the time to read the book of Acts slowly. Through, through, read through it slowly one day when you got some extra time. And you'll find out that the 28 books found in Acts are revelatory as far as the order of the church and how as soon as the church is orderly and confrontational with the devil, you see a spiritual war break out. Simon the sorcerer shows up. Elimaeus the sorcerer. The woman possessed with the spirit of divination. I mean, it's riots in cities. The spirit world is set on fire. Because now you've got two confrontational forces that are button heads in a military fashion. That's what we need to see happen again. The church is too cowardly. It's in disarray. It's, it's, it's disorderly. And it's dysfunctional. 
It has to be called back into order. That's our job, and that's what we'll do in Jesus' name. All right, let's get going here for today. The, the uh, message today is entitled Masters of the Game. Masters of the Game. Masters of the Game. Some games call for you to be a master to win at it. So we're going to cover one such game today and show you how you got to be a master of the game to win. Let's pray and we'll get going. Father, we thank you for this time of sharing. Thank you for the word of God. Give us the grace to both speak and hear your word. Change us into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ that we might be filled with the Holy Ghost and fight a productive warfare to overcome your adversaries and set the captive free. Bring in the church alive in our time and bringing in those that have been disenfranchised and kept out, lost and damned in their trespasses and sins. Bring them back alive. The Bible calls it being born again so that they might know you, the true and living God, and have a relationship with you that's going to lead to eternal life. God, bind the devil. Cast down imaginations that bind the people. God, every image the devil has erected in their minds, destroy it that they can hear this message and come alive in Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Masters of the game. Look at Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17 is where we'll jump off at with this message, Masters of the Game. Acts chapter 17. We'll begin to read here at verse 16. Acts 17 verse 16. Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Now, that's America today. The whole nation given to idolatry. Think about what I'm saying. This is a nation of idol worshipers. They'll stand there at the Grammys, worshiping idols all night long, broadcasting it. Then they'll spend the next two weeks talking about it. Then they'll spend the next month and a half showing off the wardrobe of whores standing on the red carpet naked at the Grammys. It's a nation wholly given over to idolatry. Therefore, disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. Then certain, certain philosophers... Now listen to this now. This is what contends with you and me all day long in the gospel. Certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him and some said, what will this babbler say? Hold it, man. He's the gospel preacher and he's the babbler. You're the silly philosopher. You're the babbler. Other, some he seemed to be a setter forth of strange gods because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. Now, here, now look at this now. <clears throat> a city bathed in idolatry. He preaches Jesus Christ, the one true God. He's preaching a strange God. And, and they, they see him as setting forth strange gods. And he's a babbler because he preached about Jesus Christ and his resurrection from the dead. The only thing that is true is marginalized as something that is crazy. Think about what I'm saying. Think about your family members. Think about people that you know. The only person telling the truth is now viewed as the nut. Why? Because the nation has been wholly given over to idolatry. The rejection of Jesus Christ is not the rejection of Jesus Christ in a um, insignificant way. The rejection of Jesus Christ happens when you favor another God instead of Jesus Christ. See, this, the people are not neutral. You just have another God. So when the real God comes to accost you, you reject him because you already have a God. That's what's wrong with your family, your friends, your neighbors who don't want Jesus Christ. It's not that they're neutral. They're not agnostic. They're not atheists. They have another God already. So Jesus Christ is offensive to them. You have to know that so you won't feel like, man, they seem strange. They're weird. Why can't they see this? I'm telling them the truth. It doesn't matter if it's true. 
they already have another God. So they don't care if it's true. They already have another God. So everything they do is centrally focused on the fact, hey, I don't want your God because I already have one. And Jesus Christ becomes offensive to them. You've got to know that. You've got to know that so you'll know what you're standing up against and what's standing up in people against you. And they took him and brought him unto Arapagos, saying, may we know what this new doctrine whereof you speak is? May we know what this new doctrine is? What are you talking about? What is this new doctrine you're bringing up, Paul? For you bring certain strange things to our ears. We would know, therefore, what these things mean. You're, you're talking something strange, and we want to know what you're talking about, man. For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else. Now, listen to this. These folks spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. What am I describing? Facebook. They stay on Facebook all day trying to tell and hear something new. That's why you're bound and tied up and can't progress in God. You can't sit on Facebook just wanting to hear and tell new things all day. Some folks just, folks just sit at their computer and at their cell phone all day monitoring Facebook. You're not growing in Christ. You're not growing in grace. You don't know the gospel. You don't know Jesus Christ. There's no personal time spent in prayer and fasting and study and meditation on the word. You're just telling and hearing some new thing all day long. Then Paul stood up in the midst of Mars Hill and said, you men of Athens, I perceive that in all these things, you are too superstitious. Deis demonis, that word is de, deis demonisterios. Deis demonisteros in the Greek. Deis demonosteros. What does that mean? In the middle of that word is the word daemon. D-A-I-M-O-N. The word daemon is the Greek word for demon. So you are basically, you're too spiritual. You're, what he's saying to them in, in present day vernacular, you are too deep. You think too deeply. Your mind is so deep that you become dumb in your deepness. It's the way a lot of people are. They become so spiritual, they think, that they become idiots. Because this is not about information and knowledge and what you can know in a spiritual sense. It's about a person named Jesus. It's about the person, not the information. That's why it's so foreign to people. Notice how people will go after anything that will append itself to their pride because it gives them more knowledge than you. You ever heard uh, uh, the 5 percenters trying to spit knowledge at you? Trying to impress you by the junk they know about history in Egypt and the black man in Africa and the names of the old Egyptian kings and queens and that will make you into a babbling brute. It will make you into a moron trying to know things. What is the anchor? What is the opening that allows that stuff into your mind? Pride. I'm trying to know more than you. I'm not trying to know Jesus. I'm trying to know more than you. What's the religious Christian version of it? I'm trying to know more about the Bible than you. I know more scriptures. I remembered more scriptures. It's pride, man. Pride is so ugly. It's so nasty. Because it will anchor you in nothing but self trying to know data. But you still won't know Jesus Christ. I don't know him. I know information about him. I know information about God. I know information about the Bible. 
I know information that a lot of folks have taught me over the years, but I still don't personally know him. So you see now, this is the contrast that the apostle runs into here. People who are philosophers, who just want to know and tell something new every day, even if it's about the Bible, even if something about the, the subject matter is pertaining to spiritual things that are, that are authentic, that's all they live for. They don't know Christ, just want to come up, with, uh, come up with stuff to tell you. So they always try to get somewhere and try to teach you something that they can't live themselves. Nobody's being saved, nobody's being affected. And the folks that hear it, they will babble on about the authenticity of it and say, oh, this is a blessing, this is really something. But they're, they're in a whirlwind of data and information. It's not going anywhere, it's just a whirlwind of nothing but information and data. And you can always impress a third grader if you're in the 12th grade. If you, you hung around religious stuff longer than somebody else, you can always seem to impress the person that just got into it. You don't know the Lord. You just know a bunch of stuff that they don't know. So it seems very impressive to them that you're deep in the Lord. That's why he calls them superstitious. Des de monasteros. Spiritually influenced by the demons. See the da daemon in the middle of that, that word lets you know that the superstition is stimulated by the demons. The demons are inspiring a lot of religious sounding, supernatural, esoteric information. And it's impressing people. A philosopher seems impressive when he speaks. Why do you think motivational speakers get paid so much money? Guys that run around trying to inspire you to live better. And, and uh, that's, what, that's what T.D. Jakes is and uh, Joe Lowstein and these guys. They're just motivational speakers. They're trying to teach you how to have a better life on earth. They're philosophers. But that inspires people because people want stuff where? Here. And they want it when? Now. I'm living in the here and now. I don't hear that pie in the sky stuff about heaven and Jesus Christ, the Lord of heaven, and he is the Lord of, of, of glory, and we're blessed with heavenly blessings. And, and I don't want to hear that stuff. I want to know how I can get paid here and how I can get paid now. I want to hear this other stuff you're talking. That's what the conflict is in church. So folks that still want to follow and they want to be uh, some kind of a star, a religious star. They start making videos and running around trying to tell folks about how to live. But they have no relationship with Jesus Christ. They're not seeing anything productively done in their lives. But they're just around talking all day. <clears throat> trying to hear and tell some new thing. They read a book and regurgitate the book. You could have read the book yourself. You see how crazy it is. You don't need another person to regurgitate a book to you. I remember uh, Bert Clinton said one time with how he used to hate it when the president would give a speech and then right after the speech, some news commentator would come to analyze the speech. He said, man, I just listened to the speech, man. I don't need you to tell me what he said. I just listened to it. Who needs an analyst to tell you what the man said if you just listen to it yourself? But that's the devil. He always tries to interpret to you what something should have meant or what should have been said. That's why Eve got into trouble. So God said we can't touch and we can't eat this fruit of this tree. Had God really said that? The devil comes with a question to me. Had God said that? Then if he can't deny he said, you know what this next thing is? See, God knows in the day that you eat thereof, you'll be like a God yourself. So now he causes the enmity to develop between Eve and God based on God's motivation for telling her not to eat it. See, God is evil. I'm coming as an angel of light to inspire you, to motivate you to be a God. I'm trying to benefit you while God is trying to keep you back from what? Your success in life. God is trying to hinder your progression. He's trying to downplay you. When I'm trying to uplift you, I want to see you reach what? 
your maximum potential. That's why you see books like The Potential Principle. Have your best life now. Every day is Friday. Oprah's success seminars. That's, what the, that's the devil. That's an angel of light. He's trying to benefit you in the here and now. And I'm preaching pie in the sky with what I'm saying. I'm preaching a coming kingdom with a coming king in the future who is going to reign. I want what I want now. So I'm, a, I'm, I'm following philosophers that will give me hope for now. When you got a grave to look forward to tomorrow morning, you're going to die. And this is all preparation for life after your death. Nothing is about the here and now. Everything you go through is preparing you to live again. You're living to live again. Resurrection life is what it's all about. But the good news is Jesus Christ made a way to experience resurrection life now. If you let him embody you, if you let the Holy Ghost fill you, the Bible says you'll get a taste of the powers of the world to come now in Hebrews chapter 6. The day that you begin to live your life to set other people free from here is the day you'll really start living. Preaching the gospel, bringing people up out of this hell hole and bringing them to salvation. That'll be the first day of your life that will have meaning because now you're extracting people from impending danger and damnation by saving their souls from the devil's contamination. That's what it's all about. It makes perfect sense. Give God a body to work through. The blessings of God are received because he has a body that he can work through. He'll bless the vessel because he's using the vessel. Everybody knows if you got a car, you're not trying to take care of your neighbor's car down the street. You take care of the car you're driving. You get the tune-ups on your car. Your air pressure is checked. Your timing belt is changed. It's, you gas up your car. You wash your car. You don't know what's happening to the guy's car down the street. Why? Because you drive this car. So God, if he has a vessel, meaning you or me, is going to take care of the vessel because the vessel is accommodating God so that God can express himself through it. He's going to take care of you based on you giving yourself back to him as a vehicle of expression. That's why you don't have time to be running around as an emulator trying to act like you're something that you're not. And just imagining in your mind all this spiritual stuff that God is doing. And the Lord told me, and I got a sign from heaven that, look, man, stop acting so silly and just sit your behind down somewhere and let God transform your mind so you'll be normal again. Sin will drive you to the brink of insanity. And salvation is designed to bring you back from the insanity of sin. That's all salvation is. You were losing your mind or you had lost your mind and God is bringing your mind back to restoration of your soul. Psalm 23, he restoreth your soul. When he restores your soul, he restores your mind to sanity. It's not that hard to understand. We were being driven insane. Who would sit around smoking cigarettes or smoking dope or drinking liquor all night? Fornicating with strangers, living like a dog, snorting crack and snorting, smoking cocaine and snorting, uh, snorting cocaine and smoking crack, living like a dog, shooting up heroin, half crazy, looking at porno all night, all day, living like an animal. That's, you're insane. I gave you a description of insanity. And all salvation is is saving us from insanity. The corrupting of the mind. Mental intrusion by Satan corrupts the thinking processes and you're being guided and, and, and you're, you're being inspired by the leadings of an insane spirit, Satan himself. Led by insanity, I become insane. You can't afford to follow the devil because the devil lost his mind eons ago. You know, the devil went insane eons ago. So he's, he's, a, he's, a, he's an evil genius. Kind of like Hitler. Evil 
but ingenious. Insane, but smart. And you follow that fool, and he'll lead you right off of a cliff. Folks are wasting up years of their lives circling in the realm of insanity. And they've religiousized and made it sound like it's about Jesus and the Bible and their spiritual. You better get your mind reeled back in and submitted to God to have your mind made into a normal mind again. Because the exposure to this world, the music and entertainment of this world will drive you out of your senses. So you see there, this philosophical mind, when confronted with the gospel, makes the gospel foreign to it. The gospel is strange to a philosopher. They're idolaters. They worship another God. And the God has built up a stronghold within their minds. How do they do it? By the things they know. This is the domain of Aristotle and Socrates and Plato. Philosophy. Very intellectual, enlightened ones. Illuminated minds that know more than you and me. The deep thinkers of our day. Man... Get as far away from that stuff as you can. It will drive you off the deep end. This is the very root of, of things like Scientology. You know, the things that Will Smith and Tom Cruise and all these people follow. Scientology is based on aliens coming to Earth. Did you know that? Theons from another planet that actually seeded Earth. And we're, and we're actually alien offspring that were put here. And through levels of illumination, we're being joined back to our real fathers who came from the star systems. And that's the hidden meaning behind Scientology. They don't tell you up front, but when you get into the higher levels of Scientology, you find out the secret of Scientology, which is we came from aliens that seeded the planet. And see, they believe that once you reach that level of uh, actualization when you know the truth about yourself then you see how Will Smith's daughter and son see school as meaningless to us they tell you we can bend time you ever heard, you ever heard of these uh, entities called airbenders and time benders we can slow time down or speed it up because we have these higher levels of intellect where that natural world is controlled by us because our fathers who are aliens make this world and the systems in it subject to their minds. You ever seen Star Trek where you meet these entities with these big old bubble heads talking to uh, Captain Kirk and Spock? Intellectual giants. These are these nothing, nothing but the pictures of fallen angels and demons. You get into the wrong religions. Religious systems, Buddhism, Hinduism, all this stuff looking for nirvana and some kind of a, a utopian society once you realize that you are a god. And the alien delusion is one that's being used in Scientology to make people believe that you're actually, you're actually ascending to this level of being a master, a master of the game. See, it's in the mind. You become a master of the game. Where? In your mind. You access what? Knowledge. I'm spitting knowledge. And the thing is all about a little baby born in a manger 2,000 years ago. They grew up amongst us, died on a cross, and all you got to do is know him. I don't like that. Because that's not what? It's not deep enough. See, that sim the simplicity of Christ won't appeal to the deep philosophical thinker. That's why Christ is seen as lowly and nothing to them because it's not intellectual enough, it's not deep enough to just know him. Man, the simple thing made hard by a carnal mind looking to know knowledge of good and evil. Same thing back to the Garden of Eden. 
You'll be a God because you'll have the knowledge of good and evil in you. And that will make you a God. In other words, what do you have? You have independent abilities to do whatever you want to do based on what you say is good or evil. Situational ethics. I decide what's good and evil. There is no God to tell me anything. My mind has become my God. And that's what we're looking at. That's why you see the world corrupting and accepting perversion is normal because there is no perversion. If I become a God to myself, there, you can't define perversion by what I do because I, I, de I determine what's right or wrong. If homosexuality is right to me and for me, you can't judge me. You ever heard people saying in church, nobody can judge me? That's that mind talking to you. That's that mind. You don't have to judge people. Let's read from the Bible. The Bible's already judged everybody. I'll read from the Bible verbatim and they'll say you can't judge me. How am I judging you and I just read it from the Bible? God judged you. Yeah, but you don't have the right to say it out loud. That's what hate speech is. You read from Romans chapter 1 and Leviticus about homosexuality and it's hate speech because nobody has the right to write a book or read from a book that judges me the Christian is about to be the odd man out you might as well get ready for it masters of the game ascended masters of the game we are philosophical people we are higher than you we know more than you we are better than you and your lowly, pitiful, stinking Jesus Christ who we hate. Man, get ready for a roller coaster ride at the end of this age. Because this thing is picking up steam. And it's picking up steam very rapidly. Look at Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. We're slowing it down today. To take a good look at this because this is what we're facing at the end of time. And you've got to be prepared for it. You can't afford to just blow it off now. You've got to be prepared for what's coming because it's going to get very, very tumultuous here. And it's going to happen overnight. Colossians chapter 2 verse 1. For I would that you knew what great conflict I have for you and for them at Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. So Paul says, I got conflict about you now. That their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God, and of the Father, and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of what? Wisdom and knowledge. In Jesus Christ, are hid all the mysteries of wisdom and knowledge. That word wisdom is the Greek word Sophia. The word knowledge is the Greek word gnosis. So Sophia is one of the words that you find in the word philosophy. Philos, Sophia, philosophy. What does it mean? Philos means love. Married to Sophia, lover of wisdom. So a philosopher is a lover of wisdom. When you philosophy, you speak out the wisdom that you love. A philosopher. So he, now you got to understand now when you read the Bible, when you begin to read Galatians and Ephesians and Colossians and and uh, Thessalonians and the apostle is fighting something. First Corinthians chapter two, he's fighting something. It's the philosophies of men. It's the carnal mind pitting itself against the word of God. It's a battle going on that you, if you don't know what the battle is, you don't understand why he's saying what he's saying. It's the culture trying to contaminate the church with the philosophies of men. If you read the Bible knowing that, you'll understand in a deeper way why he says what he says. He's trying to push the culture of the world back out of the confines of the church. 
because they're trying to contaminate the church with the philosophies of men. So that's why it says in Jesus Christ, all the treasures you're looking for as far as wisdom and knowledge is contained in Christ. Don't look any further than Christ. Forget Socrates, forget Plato, forget, forget Aristotle, forget the Homer, the Homer's writings, the, the Odyssey and the Iliad. Forget all of that. Forget the human, humanities they teach you in college. You've got to get back to Christ as the source of all wisdom and knowledge. And this I say, lest any man should do what? Beguile you, deceive you with what kind of words? Enticing, enticing words. Words to draw you out. But guess what enticing words have to have to be effective? They've got to find something in you that can, they can pull on. That's why they use black pride to make you believe the black man is God. See, the enticing words found something in you. Racial hatred. It hooked onto the racial hatred in you and pulled you over into the philosophical babbling of this, these philosophers. See, it looks like it's doing something that's good for you. It looks like it's religiously astute, but in fact, it's just the philosophy of man based on pride, hatred, and racial, racial disparities and things of that nature. That's why you got to guard your heart with what? All diligence. Because out of it, out of the heart, flows the issues of life. You got to guard your heart against the philosophers. For though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in the spirit, joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. The steadfastness of your faith in in Christ. It says I'm with you in the spirit. And I can see what you're doing. That's amazing. Here's an apostle miles away. Able to see. What's going on. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord. So walk you in him. See, see look. Get out of your mind. Get out of getting information. Get out of trying to hear and tell some new thing. Get in your room with your plate turned over in prayer and fasting with your Bible open and get to know the person Jesus Christ. That's the key that unlocks everything. The apostle says that I may know him. Being made conformable to his death and know and experience the power of his resurrection. Know him, you're free. Don't know stuff. Don't know data. Don't get more information. Know him. That's the key. He says, As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk you in him, rooted and built up where? In him, and established in the faith, as you have been taught, Abounding therein with thanksgiving. Rooted and built up. Those are organic terms. Let the gospel take root in you. And let it grow up out of you. And root you in Christ. And know him. Let the foundation be knowing him. Not knowing about him. But knowing him. And that word knowing. Is a word appended to what? Intercourse. It's not sexual intercourse, but Christ got to get in you. That you know him from the inside out. You know his ways, his inclinations, his feelings, his desires, his likes, his dislikes. So you get married to a person. I don't care how much you date a person before you marry them. You don't know them yet. Because when you have a, a sexual relationship with a person, you become one with them and you know him from the inside out. You can know when they, they are hurting. You'll know when they feel any kind of way because you can feel the inside of them. You'll know what offends them because you feel them and their response to it. You'll know when something hurts them because you can feel them hurt because you're on the inside of them. The two has become one flesh. 
And the Bible paints the picture in Ephesians that just like a man and a woman become one body in the flesh through intercourse physically, Christ becomes one with his church through spiritual intercourse. That's how you know Jesus. It's not knowing about him. It's knowing him from the inside out. You know the small nuances of his personality. You know when he's offended. You know when he's thinking something and what he's thinking about. You can feel the impulses of the heartbeat of God because you're on the inside of God through a spiritual intercourse. This is a lesson that can't be taught. It has to happen to you. He says, beware lest any man does what? Spoils you through what? Philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. That's Joel Osteen 101. Thousands of books sold. Hundreds of millions of dollars pumped into the ministry. All for naught, for nothing. A waste of time. Philosophy and vain deceit. Traditions of men. The rudiments, the decorations of this world. And he's not leading you to Christ. Man. And billions are sunk into this stuff every year. That's why we say, look, we've got to reform our side of religion. We got to pull the church folk over to the side and sanctify them. Like Jehoshaphat said, before you go into battle, sanctify yourself so fast. Separate off from all of this. And we got to start with a base camp of believers with the right foundation again. And that foundation has to be Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you are complete where? Man, I, I don't know what to tell you. You don't need anything else. There's nothing else you need. You're complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. I'm complete in him and it puts me over every principality and power. The devil's forces are disarmed if I'm in Christ because I'm on top of them. In whom also you are circumcised, you're cut off with the circumcision made without hands and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. What's the circumcision of Christ? His death on the cross killed the Adamic race, cut off the body of sin from you. So the Adamic race, the Adamic mind, the Adamic inspirations don't lead you anymore. And you're free from the flesh, the world of the devil, because you've joined in Christ with Christ in his death and it cut off your Adamic lineage. So that won't inspire you, it won't govern you, it won't lead you any longer, and you're not bound by and to the flesh. Man, I just got to join into the crucifixion with Christ to cut off the thing that's been binding me my whole life. Bear it with him in baptism. You go through water baptism to signify I'm not only just dead, I'm buried. Baptism is me saying, I'm dead and buried to the world. I don't want anything else to do with it. They can have it. Bear with him in baptism, wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who has raised him from the dead. So you and I go through the whole process, death on the cross, burial with Jesus in baptism, and then God resurrect us, resurrects us from the dead while we're still in these mortal bodies to walk in the spirit not to fulfill the lust of our flesh. That's the way out of sin. There is no other way. You die to this world and the demons have no vessel to operate through because the vessel they use, the Adamic life, has been crucified. And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, have he quickened or made alive together with him, having forgiven all your trespasses? So you see now, you were dead to God in your sin because of the uncircumcision of your flesh. Your flesh was still alive. You're, it's a nature that's alive. I still enjoy sin because my fleshly nature dictated to me 
what I was to enjoy. It told me what to crave. And I just followed it till I was born again. He says, but he's made you alive now after, after he resurrected you. He's forgiven you everything you did in the flesh. Think about that now. In Christ, all of my sins and fleshly living have been expunged. They've been wiped out. Blotting out what? The handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. So all the ordinances and laws which were contrary to us have been removed. First Timothy 1 Timothy 1.9 says the law is not made for a righteous man. If, if I walk under the law, I'm telling God that Christ is not righteous. I'm in him. In him I live and move and have my being. I'm subject to him and his inspiration and, and guidance. He's leading. The Bible says as many as are led by the spirit of God, they're the sons of God. So if I go back to the law, I'm telling God that Christ needs a law. And the Bible says the law is not made for a righteous man. First Timothy 1 Timothy 1.9. Therefore, I am calling Christ unrighteous if I go back to the law. So therefore, you don't need the ordinances and the laws because you're in Christ and the governing entity in Christ is the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is never going to lead you to do something contrary to God's will, his word, and his government. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly triumphing over, over them in it. So he says the handwriting of ordinances was against us, contrary to us, contrary to us, and took, he took them out of the way, letting those ordinances to his cross. He spoiled principalities and powers, the entities that were binding us, the demons and the fallen angels. He made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. In other words, he went down into the spirit world and triumphed over those entities that were captivating us. He says, then let no man therefore judge you in what meat, what you eat, in drink, what you drink, or in respect of a holy day, what we call holidays, or of the new moon, or of the Sabbath days. Seventh-day Adventists need to hear that. The Sabbath day is not just one day of the week. The Sabbath days had many different dictates. They were, they were about Sabbath days. He said, don't let anybody even bring that stuff up to you and judge you in any way. He says, look, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. So the Old Testament dictates were the shadow of Christ. They weren't him. But now in the New Testament, we've got the person Christ. So if I'm dealing with laws and rules and ordinances, I'm trying to worship a shadow. Why would I worship the shadow of the king when I've got the king? That's the mind of fallen man. Won't come to the person, but still trying to just grovel around and, and hang around the shadow of the person. Still trying to bring up rules and regulations and laws to live by because they won't come to Jesus to get to know him personally. Let no man, he used the same word again, beguile. You know, beguiling somebody is appended to deception. Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he have not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. And not holding the head from which all the body by joints and bands have nourishment ministered and knit together increasing with the increase of God. In the body of Christ, you're being nourished in the body. Everything joined together in the body and growing together increased by God. Don't worship angels. You know, Jehovah Witnesses say that Jesus is an angel. Did you know that? Did the Jehovah Witnesses tell you that Jesus is Michael the Archangel? And the Bible says in Hebrews, to which angel did he say at any time, sit thou at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. He hasn't said anything to an angel. You got Michael the archangel doing things in Revelation and outside of Jesus totally doing things separate from him. And yet the Jehovah Witnesses tell you that Jesus is the manifestation in the flesh of Michael the archangel. What's happening? Puffed up, 
vainly in their proud carnal minds listening to philosophers because they don't know him, Jesus. So they have to listen to the philosophies of men. And they're walking around door to door trying to make you believe they know more than you. They'll come to your door and you tell them, look, I'm a born again Christian. I've been saved for 20 years. And they still trying to make you see something in the watchtower and make you understand. Can you understand? I'm telling you, I've been born again, washed in the blood for 20 years. You're in a delusion. This foolishness you're trying to bring people under is nothing but the law and regimentation of the devil. Well, let's look right here at the watchtower. Look what I'm saying right here. <laughs> they just go on and on. What's happened? They've been brainwashed by the philosophies of men. They can't hear you. The devil has them captivated by the demonic powers that have been forecasted against them. They've been divined upon by supernatural forces. Wherefore, if you be dead in, with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why as though living in the world are you subject to ordinances? That word there for ordinances is dogmatizo in the Greek. Dogmatizo. We get the word dogma. The dogmas of a belief system. The word dogmatizo means laws. Why are you subjecting yourself to dogma, to laws? They tell you touch not, taste not, handle not. Which all are to perish with the using after the commandments and doctrines the doctrines of men which things have indeed a show of wisdom it has a show of wisdom in will worship will worship will power is being used will power is soul power it's not holy ghost worship it's not led by the spirit it's my will engaged there is what is known as the latent power of the soul the soul emulates God's spirit it tries to look like it's spiritual. It'll sound spiritual. It'll talk spiritual jargon. You ever heard somebody praying trying to sound spiritual? Oh, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Oh, yes, Lord. Thank you, Father. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. We praise you. We praise you. Oh, yes, Lord. Yeah. Hadn't said a thing yet. <laughs> Prayer is conversational. Just talk to the Lord. He's not impressed by a lot of history on and a lot of emotionalism and a lot of soul power. You've been taught that stuff. Don't get mad at me. Divest yourself of it. Expunge it from your system and go back to what is absolutely necessary in life. Just become normal again. Just become normal again. You've been taught all this religious stuff. And nobody can receive it when they're looking for salvation because you're at too religious. It'll do it to you every time. You'll, you'll change character around church and church people. You'll act like you normally do everywhere else, but you get in the church. Oh, yes, Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, brothers. Praise the, hey, praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank Stop. Stop. What are you doing? I just asked you how you're doing. <laughs> Blessed, abundantly blessed, blessed, more blessed than the rest, too, too blessed to be stressed. Pray the Lord, pray the Lord, pray the Lord, pray the blessed, abundantly blessed. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I was just asking you, could it just exhaust you? That stuff will take you over and drive you into madness if you don't stop. Stop getting mad at me for bringing it up. And get the devil out of you. This is a religious devil. Deny him. Let God cast it off of you. And come back in your right mind. Now you can relate to people again. In your right mind. He says. Has a, it has a, indeed a show of wisdom. And will worship. And humility. And neglecting of the body. Not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. So they walk around in long robes. They look holy. They look like, hey, they real serious about the Lord. They don't wear any makeup. They let their hair just mat up on their heads and just walk around like, you know, this is holy. I just walk around and I just look rusty and nasty and greasy and ashy. And that's a holy look. And they'll look, walk around like this is 
the Lord. So you get a young girl, fashion conscious, sharp as a tack, got herself together, and all the women in church try to make her over into you just too, you think, you see, that's worldly how you look. That's too flashy, and that, that's, that's not of the Lord. And they stand there looking like, you know, oldest Campbell from off of Andy Griffith, trying to make a young girl conform to them. Don't you let somebody make a fool out of you in church and make you start looking rusty. Because you, you want to get married as a young woman. Ain't nobody going to be looking at you looking like somebody that, 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 that came in from, the, from Noah's flood. <laughs> you better, well, I just survived the flood and I'm just, look. You better go somewhere and dress for success for real. Fix yourself up. Look good. Smell good. Walk down the street feeling good. And don't let religious fanatics make you over into some kind of a nutcase trying to satisfy their dictates under the law for you. You better get to know the Lord. The Lord's not offended about you, uh, by you looking good. Matter of fact, he wants you to look good. He wants you to feel good. He wants you to be refreshed. He wants you to be on top of everything. Rusty looking folk are not holy folks. Don't buy into it. You'll end up over there with ISIS somewhere in the desert covered in sand. Thinking, I'm fighting for the, I'm fighting for God. Man, please. See how religion will do you? Have you out there with a gun killing people for God? Look, man, stop. Let the Lord return you back to sanity. You've been driven out of your senses. The devil will drive you insane. He'll have you on the street. It's going to be 110 degrees in June. You out there on the street with a bean panel and a seersucker suit on with a bow tie, sweating like a pit bull, selling newspapers and bean pies and fruit. and, and uh, I mean, I don't know this bean pie out here in, this, in the sun, man. You had this bean pie in the sun all day. You try to sell it to me. It's been a 110 degree heat. Is this bean pie fresh? Is this fruit fresh? What are you doing? How did you get out here doing this? You listen to the philosophies of men. It drove you out of your mind. And you believe this stuff. And all you got to know is Jesus Christ. To bring you back into a normal thinking pattern. So you walk around normal again. Don't let religious spirits get a hold of you. They will drive you into madness. If you then be risen with Christ. Seek those things which are above. Where Christ sits on the right hand of God. Set your affection. That word in the Greek is the word for mind. Pronio. Phronio, check, set your phronio, the mind, on things above, not on things on the earth. Why? Because you are dead. And your life is hid with Christ in God. So you might as well just forget everything on earth because you're dead to the world in this, this planet. Set your mind on things above because you're dead. And your real life has to be discovered. Discovered because it's hid. It's hid with Christ in God. It's a hidden thing. You got to go discover your life. You've been alive for 30 years, but you never met yourself. I don't know who I am, what I am, what I'm doing, and why I'm doing what I'm doing. I'm down here dragging through life with no meaning, no destination, no future, no destiny. Because I don't know who I am. Christ gives you identity. You find out for the first time who you are, what you are, and what you're meant to do. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. Mortify, therefore, kill, disempower your members which are upon the earth. Then he enumerates the members. Fornication uncleanness inordinate affection evil concupiscence 
That Greek word for concupiscence, epithumia. Epithumia. What does it mean? Concupiscence is longing for what is forbidden. Lust for something that God has forbidden you to have. Evil desire for something that you shouldn't want. Epithumia. Evil concupiscence. And covetousness, which is idolatry. Covetousness. I want what you have. I want everything. I idolize it. I want it for me. For which things say the wrath of God comes on the children of disobedience. The children of rebellion are full of this stuff. In the which you also walked some time when you lived in them. But now you also put off all these. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy commu communication out of your mouth. This is the most filthy talking generation in the history of the earth. I have never seen as many women as I, as I see today using the F word like they do. F this, F you, F this. You see women just using that word in a cavalier you know, just 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 throwing it around like it, it's just normal. A woman talking like this. Filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another. Seeing that you have put off what? The old man. That word for man, anthropos. The old anthropos. Get the English word anthropology from it. The, this, the, the, the study of man and the history of man. Put off that clown. Put off that drag. Put off the old Adamic man with his deeds and what he does. And now put on the new man which is renewed in what? Knowledge. Epinosis. The knowledge after the image of him that created him. Now this is spiritual knowledge coming from God. It's not like earthly worldly knowledge. This is the epinosis that comes from God, spiritual knowledge, to renew you, reinvent you. The Bible says it transforms you, changes you into the image of God himself that you can relate to God. You want to be able to relate to God, but you can't full, full of the world's devices and the world's knowledge. The philosophies of this world short circuit the relationship with God because you know more about this world than you do about God. And then you sit around on Facebook wanting to tell and hear some new worldly thing all day. More knowledge, more information, more data. It's short-circuiting you and you don't even know what's happening to you. You're renewed in the knowledge after the image of him that created you. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, Barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, black nor white, Hispanic nor Oriental. But Christ is all and in all. It's all about Jesus Christ. You drag racial perversion into this thing, you'll bring in racial disharmony with your, your looking at your history, your lineage, my genealogy. Don't drag that over here. Christ is all that matters. That offends you. You're proud. You're lifted up. You're a philosopher bound to your own mind. And you better get rid of that demon that's binding you to your racial heritage. It's a demon that's doing it. You better renounce that devil and ask God to expunge your soul from that racially uh, binding demon. It's binding you to your race. I don't care if you're black, white, Hispanic, Oriental, green, purple, or red. It's a demon that binds you to the here and now in your racial heritage. Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. This is what you're putting on now. Forbearing, you're putting up with one another. And forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do you. And above all these things, put on charity, love. Charity is expressed as giving. Love is expressed as giving. Above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. 
Remember the Bible says, I can, I can prophesy, I can give myself to be burned, I can know all mysteries, but if I have not charity, if I have not love, I'm empty. I got nothing. I do a bunch of junk, but I don't have love. I don't have selflessness bound to my heart. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts to the which also you are called in one body. And then he says, be thankful. And be thankful for what God has done for you. Be thankful for your life. Be thankful that you've been born again. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And I don't see nothing about no hip hop and rap in that. Songs, hymns, spiritual songs. Psalms are spiritual. Hymns are spiritual and spiritual songs. All of these are generated by the Holy Ghost. None of it comes out of the mind of a man. Philosophers come up with another way to do it. And I think that's good enough. That's the strange fire offered up by people thinking that all music comes from God. It does not come from God. There are other inspirations for music other than God. Satan inspires music also. He's a musical maestro, as a matter of fact. Singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Everything done is inspired by the Holy Ghost because the Bible tells us that the Holy Ghost has the mind of God. He has the mind of God. He knows what God likes. He knows what God wants. He knows what God prefers. He knows what God wants to get back from us. So if you link to the Holy Ghost, everything you do will be inspired by God because the Holy Ghost is God. God is not depending on us to think up anything. He's depending on us dying to the flesh to let the Holy Ghost govern us through interacting with our minds. That's what it's all about. So you see now, these two things, Sophia and Gnosis. Sophia and Gnosis, wisdom of philosophers, the love of wisdom. Gnosis, knowledge. Now, Gnosis is the governing element that, that actually uh, uh, defines Gnosticism. You hear a lot of people talk about Gnosticism. What is Gnosticism? Gnosticism is a prominent, prominent heretical movement of the second century Christian church. Partly of pre-Christian origin. In other words, some parts of Gnosticism came about before Christianity was founded in the book of Acts. Gnostic doctrine taught that the world was created and ruled by a lesser divinity the, the Demurgos, Demurgos is how you pronounce it, Demurgos. Now, the Demurgos is actually a lesser entity. Now, there are many gods. We're looking at pantheism and, and, uh, uh, and all these kinds of different God-worshiping systems where there are a lot of different gods. So, Demurgos was a lesser god that created everything. And he actually, this thing was actually emanating out of the mind of Sophia. So see, Sophia is a goddess. And Demiurgos emanated from the mind of Sophia and created everything. And it, it believes that Christ was an emissary of the remote supreme divine being. So he, Christ was sent by Demiurgos. And his mission was to bring esoteric knowledge or the gnosis which enabled the redemption of the human race. So it's the knowledge. See now, now look at this now. The Gnostics believe the knowledge is what saves you. Jesus is just a vessel that encapsulates knowledge. So to know is what's going to save you. Not to be born again. You see how, now see how the trick is? It's not focused in your heart changing. It's your mind knowing. If I can just get more information, 
it's going to qualify me to be saved. Qualify me to be a person that ascends into a place of knowing that I am divine. That's the devil. Now look at the devil's promise in the Garden of Eden. Eat the fruit. You'll know good and evil and be as a God. It's, all, it's the same thing. So Gnosticism is, you see it in all kinds of movies. Avatar, The Matrix. See, the one was an enlightened one. Out, you came outside of the matrix in your mind. See how everything was hooked up to your mind? You believe you're in the matrix because the computers put you there, but your mind, if detached from the computers and that, that virtual reality, your knowledge is now making you an enlightened one. We're looking for the one to come and lead us against these machines because we know. So we know. Oprah promotes books like The Secret. That's in a book of enlightenment. You got access to the hidden knowledge. The Masons are built on being an illuminated one that knows the hidden knowledge. The quest of man outside of Christ is to get access to the hidden knowledge. Now what's the hidden knowledge? The fact that you are a God. You're equal to God. There is no supreme God. God is an esoteric essence that you just know and believe and find out the mysteries of it all. You'll be absorbed into God as God. You can't die. You just be constantly reincarnated. So you see the world as it is, we Christians define it as corrupting and contaminated and, and dying. They see it, they see it as evolving. See, you gotta understand now. You got now I'm trying to paint this picture of how their minds really function so you'll know what you're up against. When you look at homosexuality and bisexuality and transgenderism, they see that as evolution. It's getting rid of the limitations of a person not knowing that they are God. See, as a God, I'm not bound to gender specifics. I'm a God. If I'm, if I'm with a beast, if I'm with an animal, I'm a God. I do whatever I want to do. And there is no God to answer to because I am the final authority because I am God. God is a universal essence. He's a universal intellect that if I can just merge my mind into this God knowledge, if I can plug my mind into it, I will ascend above the sides of the north. I will sit on the throne myself as God. So you look at Jay-Z. Jay-Z believes he's God. It's not, it's not a fabrication. It's not make-believe in his mind. He believes that he's a God and he believes Beyonce is a goddess. What he's been doing is teaching her who she really is. And she's buying into it. She's being transformed to know that you're a goddess, girl. You don't understand the depths of what we're in. The reason why we are almost worth a billion dollars is because we have tapped into the hidden mystery. I'm tapped in. Oprah's tapped in. Warren Buffett is tapped in. Bill Gates is tapped in. Tyler Perry's tapped in. See, all of us that have this mystery revealed to us, that's why we're ascending above the rest of the unwashed masses because they don't know the mystery. We know it. So the universe is accommodating us as gods. Now, there can be no moral code in this because we're gods. We transcend morality. If I want to be with a man, you want to be with a woman, fine. See, a lot of these guys marry these women, and they want the women to be bisexual and lesbians and all that. Because we transcend all that. We sleep three, four deep in a bed. We invite another couple over and all four of us in the bed together having sex. It's because we're gods. Then you say this is sin. There is no sin to a God. We're above all of that. This is really happening. Folks will laugh at it and joke about it and say they really believe this stuff. Yes. And you'll find they will kill you and the Bible says they'll believe they're doing God a favor. Not the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, 
the universal metaphysical God. The God consciousness is being done a favor. Because what we're doing, we're eliminating you lower species who have not received the revelation of the fact that you are a God. That's why they have award ceremonies like the Academy Awards and the Grammys. This is to give credence and honor to whom? The gods. This is real. And you watch, look how the people just flock to them and worship them on the red carpet. Why? Because the lesser demons in the people are ordered by Satan to worship the higher ranking fallen angels that live in these people. This is a stratified kingdom of darkness. Why would another human think that another human is more than them? What kind of a mindset do you have to have to believe that another human is more than you? You got to be demon possessed. And the demon in you knows that that fallen angel has been given govern governing authority over it. And you have to follow the inspirations of that demon in you. That's why you worship another human. That's why you're afraid of certain people. Because they are able to make you believe you're less than me. Go to any job. Look how they stratify the people on the job. You try to walk in a certain restroom. That's the executive washroom. You can't use that one. That's for the executives only. But I got to go. Look at that. Get out the way. Sir, will you be arrested? If you don't leave this, this floor, this is not even the floor you belong on. You work in the mail room. You're not even allowed up here. Everything is stratified. Everything has this social order. It's a caste system down here that is everywhere. You can't see the devil's kingdom sitting right in front of you. They're there to have and have nots. They're a lesser order of humans right before your very eyes. And we walk around in it all day. And people accept their assigned slots in life given to them by the devil. They stand in awe of certain people. They look up to them. For you to look up to somebody, they got to be more than you. That's why the gospel is designed to lower, the, lower all of that trash and level the playing field. Everybody is the same. You might do a different job in the, in the body of Christ, but you're not better than anybody in the body of Christ. And folk don't like that. You know why they don't like it? Because I'm trying to elevate and be promoted to be over people. I don't want to be like everybody else. You meet somebody in the world, the first thing they'll tell you, I'm not like everybody else. Dressing just like everybody else, walking just like everybody else, talking just like everybody else, listening to the same music, go to the same places, doing the same thing, and I'm not like everybody else. Yes, you are. You bought into the devil's paradigm for life. So you got to break out of this thing. It's like, a, it's like this uh, plastic bubble that surrounds us that you got to break out of, man. It's like it's cellophane wrappers that wrap you around, wrap around you. You got to break these ties, man. You got to break this bondage. The devil is always trying to limit somebody. You got to break out of the devil's mess because he's always trying to hold you back and make you believe that he is valid. So Gnosticism is actually this system of knowledge where you know things to elevate you into this God consciousness. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2. The, the apostles are fighting this all through the New Testament. That's what they're up against. That's why they say certain things the way they do. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1. And our brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, Sophia, declaring unto you the testimony of God. I didn't come trying to be a wise sage or guru, trying to be a deep guy. The, the apostle says in one place I use plainness of speech. I just taught you like a regular Joe Blow from the hood. I taught hood talk to you, man. I taught to you straight. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's all I know. 
I'm not dealing with a bunch of knowledge. I don't have a bunch of mathematical equations. I'm not taking you back in history. I'm not trying to tell you about Aristotle and Plato and Socrates. I don't know a bunch of deep things. I don't know about all these writings and all these mystic writings and all this stuff. They're trying to tell you all these formulas for life. All I know is Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words. Remember that same phrase used earlier? Don't let men beguile you with enticing words, words that draw you out. I'm not using enticing words that come from man's wisdom, his Sophia. But in demonstration, now look at this now, look at this. I'm not dealing with talking. I'm demonstrating the spirit and the power. Why, Paul? That your faith should not stand in the wisdom, the philosophies of men, but you should be believing because of the demonstrated power of God. Now, the $64 million question for a 21st century Christian is, where is the demonstrated power? Shut up. Stop talking. Where's the power? Where's the power? Where is the demonstrated power? It can only be had through the days and weeks of agonizing, prayer and fasting. Jesus speaking about demons this time a higher ranking demon of a higher ranking order goeth not out but by prayer and fasting that's telling us a key to the kingdom we're hanging around trying to see tell and hear some new thing all day anchored in knowledge from this world and the Sophia the wisdom of philosophers no power we got to return back to the basics of governmental authority in the church that will engender power to the church members. Not some uh, uh, stoic system of government based on professional ministers. That's garbage. The fivefold ministry gifts distribute the, the, the information necessary to the saints to transform them that they can do the work of the ministry. Everybody in the church should be rolling in the power of God doing the work of the ministry. Not somewhere trying to worship somebody over them like the world caste system does. You Can't you see the contrast? That's a worldly paradigm. That's the caste system of the world worshiping people because I see myself as less than them. That's garbage. There are ministers and preachers that hate me saying this. Why? Because they want to be somebody. I don't like you teaching that. I'm taught by people to be up under me and look up to me. And they come to me for everything. I've crippled them that they can't even think for themselves. I made sure by holding back the truth of the gospel and unrighteousness according to Romans chapter 1 that they don't know anything and they're dependent upon me because I'm the spiritual guru that, ha that knows God. Touch not God's anointing which I am and not you. And do his prophets, which I am one of them and not you, no harm. It only applies to me. You don't touch me. Because I'm the prophet of God. That's a bunch of garbage. Of course, they'll take that on YouTube, splice it together and say that I said that about myself. But that's the, that's the devil at work trying to undermine the truth. God is flowing through here. Distributing to every man his gifts and his talents and sending you forth in the anointing and power of God to do the work of the ministry. 7.2 billion people. Man, you need, you need a ground army that's swelling, man, to reach these folks. You don't need a one or two guys somewhere in, a, in some stupid church in a pulpit trying to preach. You need, a, you need ground forces that are taking the world by force and taking the gospel by force. So everybody needs to be equipped and anointed to do the job. And not sitting somewhere in awe of Jay-Z. You got Jay-Z in the pulpit now trying to be the, 
the man of sin over the church. This is crazy. People are losing their minds in church. But these masters of the game, these ascended masters who have perfected the chess game, who know how to confront and intrude upon your mind to captivate you, have bound people, bound them, philosophers, with some pseudo wisdom, some kind of make believe knowledge coming in to captivate the people. Second Corinthians chapter 4. Second Corinthians chapter 4. I'll show you what the, the whole end game is for this intrusion of philosophy and knowledge into the church. First of all, let me give you a small lesson on a game. It's a board game that a lot of people play. And it's not for people who can't think. And the game is chess. Chess is a, is a game for tacticians and strategists. It's a thinking man's game. Chess is a two-player strategy board game played on a chess board. A checkered game board with 64 squares arranged in an 8x8 eight eight grid. It is one of the world's most popular games played by millions of people worldwide in homes, parks, clubs, online, by correspondence and tournaments in recent years, chess has become part of some school cur curricula. Each player begins the game with 16 pieces. One king, one queen, two rooks, two knights, two bishops, and eight pawns. Each of the six piece types moves differently. The objective is to checkmate the opponent's king by placing it under an, under an inescapable threat of capture. To this end, a player's pieces are used to attack and capture the opponent's pieces while supporting their own. In addition to checkmate, the game can be won by voluntary resignation by the opponent, which typically occurs when too much material is lost or if checkmate appears unavoidable. Uh, unavoidable, unavoidable. A game may also result in a draw in several ways where neither player wins. The course of the game is divided into three phases. Now look at these three phases. Opening, middle game, and end game. Now right now on earth, we're in the end game. This has been a universal historical chess match played between God and the devil. And now we're in the end game. The first official world chess champion, Wilhelm Steinitz, claimed his title in 1886. The current world champion is the Norwegian Magnus Carlsen. In addition to the world championship, there are the women's world championship, the junior world championship, the world senior championship, the correspondence chess world championship, the world computer chess championship, and blitz and rapid world championships. The Chess Olympiad is a, is a popular competition among team, teams from different nations. Online, chess has opened amateur and professional competition to a wide and varied group of players. Chess is a recognized sport of the International Olympic Committee and international chess competition is sanctioned by the World Chess Federation, which adopted the now standard Staunton chess set in 1924 for use in all official games. There are also many chess variants with different rules, different pieces, and different boards. Since the second half of the 20th century, computers have been programmed to play chess with increasing success, to the point where the strongest home computers play chess at a higher level than the best human players. In the past two decades, Computer analysis has, has contributed significantly to chess theory, particularly in the end game. The computer Deep Blue, that's the name of the computer, Deep Blue, was the first machine to overcome a reigning world chess champion in a match when it defeated Gary Kasparov in 1997. So now, through, through, through uh, computer programming, the mind of chess masters have been input, input into computers so that computers can now contend with you playing chess using 
uh, virtual logic, the logic in computers. So they basically do if then statements in the you know they, uh, computer programming is basically a lot of if then statements. If this happens, then you do that. Using that binary code, they can come up with different scenarios, scenarios so they can give options to the computer based on what you do. So if you make a move with your pawn or your rook, the computer can look at it and analyze it and say, I'll do this, I'll offset it. The, the computer knows that the end game is capture the king. Now there is the end game now of chess. Capture the king. If I can bind that king, I win. So checkmate is, I got your king. Capture. What's the devil's end game? First Corinthians, uh, Second Corinthians chapter four, verse one. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. But I renounce the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, committing ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts, to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. What's the end game? The to blind the mind. If I got your mind, I've captured the king. You can't do anything above what your mind allows. Your mind is the citadel of your existence on this earth. From your spirit man, God deals with your mind. From the world and the flesh, the devil accost your mind. The chess masters, Satan and God, are contending for the human mind. If our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world has blinded the mind. That's where the chess masters focus. It's the mind. They are masters of the game. The devil brings a pseudo salvation telling you that the gnosis and an access and knowledge to get you to ascend to the level of a master, an ascended master, will make you as a god. You don't need Jesus Christ because you are equal and above him. All Jesus was, the devil will tell you, was a man who had mastered his mind. He, you can be what he was because he was basically a metaphysical guru. He walked on water because his mind had the ability to transcend physical objects just like yours can. You can do what he did if you attain to the knowledge that he had. He had secret knowledge. The Masons are all about elevating through degrees of the knowledge. You can't see that they have degrees you must go through. The higher in the, in the order of the Masons, the more they give you the secret knowledge of the Masonic order. 32nd, 33rd degrees, you begin to understand that Lucifer is the source of the hidden knowledge. But you, you don't know that it's a third degree or fourth degree Mason. The Deltas, the AKAs, sororities and fraternities all go through initiations to join into the secret hidden cults of knowledge that you don't know. They have access to the hidden mysteries of their fraternal orders. You've been duped by an angel of light. That's why the Bible calls him an angel of light. He's given illumination. He's given knowledge. 
He's given access to hidden mysteries that others don't know. And he rewards you according to what? Your obedience to the illuminator. That's why they call them the illuminati. They're the illuminated ones. They know things that you common people don't know. We rule the world because we have this hidden knowledge. What do they deal in? What is the power that binds the mind? What's this mind-blinding power that captivates the world and subjects people to other people and makes people believe I'm less than other people? It can be summed up in one word, and that one word is witchcraft. They have mastered witchcraft. They know how to divine spells. They know how to send demons to do their bidding. They know how to captivate humans, kill humans using witchcraft. They send death angels to kill people. How to get Whitney Houston dead in February? Her daughter found laying face dead, a face, a face down in water, just like her mother in February. Around the same time of the Grammys, just like her mama. There are no, no happenstances down here. No circumstances that just occur, occur. It's the powers of darkness at work. Divination and witchcraft around us all day. Folks can't figure out how did this happen? Why did it happen? What was going on? When Lisa left our Lopez went down to South America to explore mysticism in the jungles of South America and he ends up dead. All these folks you see rising to preeminence, practitioners of the black arts, the dark arts. These are the witches and warlocks of society. The rulers of the world that you don't see, you don't even know their names. See, all these folks you see as front men, that's garbage. They don't have any say-so over this. There are rulers of the world that live in families that control billions of people's lives. Through withholding food and water, determining who rises up and who doesn't. They control political systems and make you believe you voted for somebody to come into office. You really believe that your vote counts. Don't you know witchcraft can even make you determine who you want to vote for? Through spells being cast and sorcery used. The Bible's language is not one of intellectual acumen the Bible speaks on witchcraft and sorcery and divinations and spell casting that's the Bible language when you see somebody's life becoming cursed it's because they got a curse on them poverty can't work living under a bridge crack addict dope addict a drunk it's witchcraft you know a lot of witches divine your demise on you so you'll need them. You'll be crippled. They make sure you never have anything because you need me. You try to depart from me, I'll make sure you never get anything. Nothing ever succeeds because you're trying to leave me. You know what I mean? If people have gone down to the root worker, the two-headed woman down in southern Alabama. It's one down here in southern Georgia, all down through Mississippi. Don't even talk about New Orleans. Go to the woman on you to get that stuff to lay down on you that you never can rise up if you try to leave me. I had a guy who had been bewitched by a woman. He could have sex with no other woman but that woman. If he, had, if he tried to have sex, he couldn't even get an erection with another woman. Call that woman that put that spell on him and you won't be able to enter any other woman's vagina but mine. I don't believe in all that stuff. It's working on you even as you don't believe in it. It won't work on you unless you believe in it. It'll work on you off from under the blood of Jesus Christ and salvation. You're not saved, but it witchcraft will work on you all day long, whether you believe it or not. Inconsequential. You're open to the devil. Taken captive, the Bible says, by the devil at his will. 
the God of this world has blinded the mind, lest the glorious light of the gospel should shine through. The devil is a metaphysical nightmare. He uses powers, supernatural powers, divine through people to captivate people. And you try to figure out why is my life in such disarray? Why is everything becoming hell on earth? Why is everything going astray? You go out there as Bruce Jenner, a decathlon champion in the Olympics, hang around those witches, and you end up wanting to be a woman. You can't fool around with a Jezebel spirit as a man. That thing will emasculate you. That thing will castrate you. It'll turn you into a girl. Till it agrees that you want to go and hack off your own penis and be one of them. And have a surgeon put a vagina in you and walk around as a woman with a pocketbook. You can't go out there as Magic Johnson fooling around with hoes and not have that spell come on your boy and turn them into a girl. Walking around in high heels and a pocketbook. That came from somewhere. Because you went out there fooling around with the devil. You fooled around with witches wanting to lay up with everyone that you ran up against. And somebody put something on you. You're not leaving me, boy. You might have hoed around with the rest of them, but I'm a witch of a high order. I'm going to take you down. If you try to leave me, I'm going to curse your family. I'm going to curse you with disease. I'm going to cause your life to be a living hell. You know why a lot of families are dysfunctional? Because witches and warlocks have sent spells through the spouse to fight the other person because that person tried to leave them. You went out there and committed adultery, but you didn't know you ran into a high-level witch. But the witch came home with you inside of your soul because the two, the Bible says, shall be one, come, become one flesh. So every time your wife tries to touch you, you got no attraction to your wife because that witch in you won't let you. Always a petty argument. Always a petty discussion. Always an attitude in the atmosphere. It's the power of witchcraft. As I'm talking right now, I can feel myself getting dizzy. Why? Because I'm dealing with witchcraft. But the blood of Jesus Christ is against you, devil. And the blood of Jesus Christ is a barrier. I dare you to step across that blood. I dare you to come against the blood of Jesus Christ. I bind you in Jesus' name. Every sorcerer, every witchcraft worker, every diviner of spells, let the spell reverse on you in Jesus' name. This is a warfare. This is the power of darkness. Remember when Jesus was being crucified, he said what? This is the power of darkness. This is the arena that church folk back away from, see? Why do you think you don't see 10,000 folk come up in here? Now, let's stand doing them as tabernacle up, man. Let's get on with this thing. They, they're spellbound. Why do you think when Elijah went in to confront Jezebel and Ahab, told them, hey, look, let's worship God if he's God. Worship Bell if he's God. And the people answered not a word. Why? Jezebel was a witch and a whore. She held those people what? Spellbound. See, spellbinding is real. I can't go. I can't turn her loose. I'm spellbound. The devil through a witch or a warlock has cast a spell on me. A thousand people listen to this message and can't move to do something about it because they're spellbound. You better break that power off of your soul, man. You better break that power off of your soul, woman. You better get that witchcraft working dog off of you and proclaim, for Christ I live and for Christ I lay down and die. I will engage the enemy at the gate. I will be a metaphysical warrior against the devil and, his and God's adversaries. I will stand against the devil. The Bible told us, no weapon formed against us shall prosper. Every tongue that rises against us in judgment is condemned. This is our inheritance and our righteousness is of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
you stand up under the blood-stained banner of Christ and proclaim the truth. There are forces down here for real. A lot of you have, been, have fallen prey to these devils. They come to you at night. They hold you down in the bed, crawl all over you in the bed, having sex with you as an incubus spirit, visiting a woman, bringing you to orgasm at night. A succubus coming into your room at night as a man, performing oral sex on you, having you ejaculating all over yourself like a dog. Talking about a wet dream. No, that was a succubus spirit that visited you by night to bring you to an erotic state, arousing you to keep stimulating you sexually. Now you sit there and park yourself in front of witches on scandal and on empire, designed to stimulate you women to the point of orgasm with no relief. Now you sit there watching Kerry Washington having sex with that guy every Thursday night or whatever night it comes on on scandal and you walk around about to burn up as a nymphomaniac being brought to the edge of orgasm watching that soft porn every week, week and you walk around at the height of sexual stimulation receiving no relief because you park yourself in front of that filth being divined upon by a spirit of eros erotic desire and now it's down inside of you burning your guts out of you because you received that demon through the airways divined on you by a witch named Carrie Washington playing out the role of a seductress in some stinking filthy television show that the devil has launched divination through. He's divining spirits on you. Empires divining homosexual and perverse spirits on you. You'll sit up there as a black woman married to a black man not wanting a black man because Carrie Washington is joined to a white man and now you're on your job lusting after white men because you got that spirit in you that Carrie Washington divined on you and it's going to tear up your home because now you want white love. I'm not talking racism. I'm talking demons and divination and the powers of darkness. Jesus said when being crucified, this is the power of darkness. Father, forgive them because they've been bewitched. They know not what they do. They've been driven out of their senses by witchcraft. The Pharisees and Sadducees just weren't jokers crucifying Jesus. These were high level warlocks. You better understand what I'm telling you. You can think I don't know what I'm talking about if you want to. I know what I'm talking about. You stand there spellbound. You listen to these messages every week and you still are contaminated by these devils. Because you've been divined on by some whore you laid down with, sir. You've been divined on by some player you laid down with, ma'am. And they've got your soul spellbound. The girl declared in her heart, you'll never leave me and succeed in life. You'll never marry somebody else. You'll always be bound by lust. And I'm going down to the witch woman to make sure my desires are fulfilled. And I, when I spread that red oil in my vagina before you run up in me, and it's going to spill all over your penis. And that red oil has anchored you to me for the rest of your life. I'll never let you go. It's a covenant cut unto death. You will be mine forever. Marry if you want to. I'll sow discord in your home and I'll make sure you get divorced. I'll sow the divorce into your home. I'll sit here at my house with your picture in my hand, spreading that red oil all over you. Get one of those dolls from the voodoo woman that's going to be your wife and stick pins in her all night. Now she got all these diseases, infirmities, and your wife going to die from the spell I sent to your home to kill her because you belong to me, boy, and I'll never let you go. This is the world we walk around in. You think you're attracted to people just because you like them. That's a witch, fool. That's a witch. It's a witch woman. She divined on you on the job. She wore that stuff she wore on the job to divine on you to take you from your wife. That's why she's showing the breasts. The breasts are divination tools. 
The physical body of a woman can be a divining rod to draw you, man. You can feel it emanating out of her when she walks by you. It's a force that walks by you that's calling you from the internal parts of her. Saying, come on into this, this vaginal cavity, boy, where you'll find pleasure. And I'm going to throw stuff on you that your wife would never dream of. Then you try to go home, but you can't shake that whore out of your mind. Because she did stuff to you that the law wouldn't allow. allow. You never seen nobody like that. She was a twerk dancer extraordinaire on you. Twerking on you like a great Dane dog driving you crazy. And you lost your mind with a twerk dancing whore. And now you sacrifice up your wife, your three children, lost your job, filing bankruptcy, brought you down to nothing. The Bible says a whore will bring you to a piece of bread, break you down. So you'll crawl back over here to me and I'll take care of you, boy. Just curl up over to the back room somewhere and stay up under my jurisdiction. Be my slave. And I'll make sure you eat and got something to wear. There's a lot of guys broken down by witches like this. We call up men to the front line. They can't come. Why? Spellbound. Spellbound. Bound by the devil's witchcraft and sorcery. I told you these are masters of the game. While you go to church. And sing little songs and listen to the choir. And some warlock preach to you. Dividing on you soul power to make sure you don't go any further in the Lord. The Lord. And you think you're going to church. You went right to the sorcerer. He divided on you a spell to keep you captivated. So what I'm saying. Just like Paul in Athens. You saw it in Acts chapter 17. I don't know what he's talking about. Spellbound. The New Testament, you know what it's really about? Slamming into sorcerers and witches. That's all they're doing. They slamming into the power of darkness. And the boys needed high level power from God to come against the power of the devil. Because the joker had set in place fallen angels and demonic principalities and powers to govern the people. And the physical people, the humans, were in place to divine up and call up these forces to stop the gospel. Somebody ran into Simon the sorcerer, Elimaeus the sorcerer, the woman possessed with the spirit of divination. Notice how the woman possessed with the spirit of divination knew who they were. She didn't stand against them. She, she actually introduced them. These be the men who have come. To show us the way of salvation. Wrong spirit. Trying to draw the attention of the people to the man. And not to God. And when the apostle got tired of the Bible. He turned on her. And cast that divination devil out of her. And the people got mad. Because the men were getting rich. Because of the woman's fortune telling ability. These are the powers we deal with. Stop kidding yourself. You better start fasting and praying your way into a place of supernatural power. This is going to be a metaphysical war. This is going to be a clash of the titans. This is going to be pitted against the devil with supernatural powers on display. You better come out of this coma. The reason why you're so laissez-faire and laid back and case sera, sera about it is because you've been divided upon by witches. You don't believe it? Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. Paul comes into Galatians hot. Look what he says. He's coming to Galatians on fire because of what's going on. And the boy comes in heavy against the Galatians and says, oh foolish Galatians. Who have bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth, crucified among you. He's dead. This only would I learn of you. 
receive you the spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. What does witchcraft do? It takes you back to the law. Jehovah Witnesses have been bewitched. Mormons have been bewitched. Seventh-day Adventists have been bewitched. Roman Catholics have been bewitched. This ain't neutral stuff. They're under a spell. Are you so foolish having begun in the spirit, in the Holy Spirit, capital S? Are you now made perfect by the flesh? Have I suffered so many things in vain, if it be yet in vain? He therefore that ministers to you the spirit and works miracles among you. You see how the spirit is operative, working miracles? Doeth he it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Is he under the law working miracles or is it just believing in Jesus Christ and operating in faith? Even as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, know you therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. The gospel is the good news not only of Jesus Christ being crucified, buried, and resurrected, the good news of the gospel, the promise made to Abraham, is the promise of the Spirit. The Holy Ghost is the gospel. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. For as many as are of the works of the law are under what? The curse. For it is written... Cursed is everyone that continues not in all things that are written in the book of the law to do them. You got to do every law. If you do one law, you must do all the law. You can't pick and choose. It's all or none. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident for the just shall live by what? Faith. What they believe. Faith. And the law is not of faith. The justified one shall live by faith. Then he turns around and says, the law is not of faith. But the man that doeth them shall live in them. You do the law, you're going to be cursed by it and you'll live under the curse of it. <coughs> That's pitiful. Having had a way of escape out of it. You go back to what the Bible calls the meek and beggarly elements of the world. Put yourself under a curse and get mad at anybody trying to liberate you from it. Mad at me right now. Turn it off the, the internet right now. Mad. All because I told you, get out from under that trash and get free. Stop sitting up in a church with some boob tuning up and yelling at you and squalling all day. Cursing your soul with sorcery and get yourself free. But you determined in your, your soul and your heart. I'll just die here. Baptist born, Baptist bred. When I die, I'll be Baptist dead. I won't come out from under this, what the Bible calls indoctrination. Dogmatizo, the dogma of religion. I'll just sit here and die and go to hell before I'll come to the freedom found in Jesus Christ. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law being made a curse for us for it is written cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ that we might receive the promise of what I told you that's the New Testament promise made to Abraham the promise of the spirit through faith God is trying to get the Holy Ghost to everybody brethren I speak after the manner of men Though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man disannuls or adds thereto. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ, saying the promise is made to Christ. You get into him. He baptizes you with the Holy Ghost. You become part of his body. You walk in the spirit, not to fulfill the lust of your flesh, and you're not under the law. Makes perfect sense. And this I say that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. Letting you know the law came 
430 years after the promise was made to Abraham. It was added because of rebellion. That was not the will of God to give the law. He gave the promise to Abraham 430 years before the law, but because they had a bunch of rebels who would not serve him, he put them under law to keep them as a schoolmaster until Christ came. The Bible says the law is the schoolmaster to lead us to Christ. For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more a promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. It's the spirit. Our inheritance is the Holy Ghost. Get full of the Holy Ghost by denying your nasty flesh and witchcraft won't work on you anymore because you're not in the, in the world and the God of this world and his power will not have dominion over you. But you got to stay in the realm where the spirit of God flows through you and keeps the devil away from you. You got to stay under the yoke of the spirit. When you're divined upon, the forces of darkness will accost you. You'll ebb and flow. You'll feel the thing come on you and try to stop you. There are supernatural forces pitted against you at all times. We're dealing with the masters of the game, the masters of witchcraft who are trying to do what? Bind the king. He's trying to bind your king. And the king is enthroned in the human mind. If your mind is governed by Jesus Christ, you'll do the works of God. Your spirit will be clear in your soul. And the citadel of the soul, which is the mind, will be out under the devil's control. Can't you see that everything that leads back to God, Romans 12, 1, transformation of the mind. Ephesians chapter 4, renewed in the spirit of your mind. We just read it a minute ago. Set your mind above, not on the earth. If our gospel be hid, it's hid to, hid to those that are lost. The God of this world blinds the mind. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're mighty through God. Casting down what? Imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. The imaginations are found where? In the mind. Can't you see it's a war for your mind? The battlefield is your mind. The chess game is played in your mind. It's a masterful game. And witchcraft is the devil's ace because most religious people don't deal with the metaphysical supernatural aspects of the gospel. And the gospel only talks about witchcraft and sorcery and divination and necromancy and all these different metaphysical forces. Old and New Testament. Simon the sorcerer is standing there in the New Testament. Illimaeus the sorcerer is in the New Testament. We walk in it all day long, folks. I was preparing this message, thinking about it, and meditating, for, on, meditating on it for a few days. Last night, I had a dream. In the dream, my wife and I had gone to some type of a, like a big castle. When these, these, these two people were there, Two went a woman and a man, the black woman and a black man, and and we were had become agents to go and spy out the sky by night. My wife and I, we flew this aircraft to take to take pictures of the stars and and to try to map out the stars at night for this agency and bring the pictures back to them. When I got back to the castle, my wife and I and my daughter were there. And we got into this real small little car. It was like the size of the old MGs. You remember the old MG cars? The little small cars that looked like a little, little sports car. But it's real small, real compact. It was a convertible car. The lady got up. But when she stood up, what struck you about the lady, her legs were so long. The lady was about eight feet tall and most of it was her legs. Which tells me she was a Nephilim. So we went to the car and got in it. The lady got in the back seat with my daughter. My wife and I got in the front seat. And we drove away. And my wife was driving. But she drove the car right into a lake. And we were about to go under and drown. But somehow we lifted the car out of the lake and put it back on the road. So we left that lake. 
and drove through a church that was vacated. Came out of the church, went to a hotel to spend the night on our way back home. The lady, I don't, she disappeared. But my wife and I and my daughter went to a room to sleep. In the room to sleep, the dream switched from being a dream to being in my room last night. I was still asleep, but something huge came into our bedroom door. It was in the ceiling, and all I could see was his hands. It was a huge entity with his hand, but this thing was big, whatever it was. It was big, and it was for real. It was a, a, a ferocious thing, whatever it was. I saw his hands, and his hands made the third eye symbol, that okay symbol with both hands were looking at me. And I knew instinctively that that was a curse. They used their hands to curse. When you flip per, a person a bird, you're pronouncing the curse on them. When somebody's lying to you and they cross their fingers, that's a curse. Mm -hmm. They used hand symbols to actually project curses. I was asleep, but I heard myself praying in tongues. Now, while all this is happening, this huge thing is in the ceiling. I'm seeing it, praying in tongues. And in actuality, in the physical realm, I'm really praying in tongues. I just don't know it. Because to me, I'm over here in this realm and this is happening. I'm not even conscious of being asleep and in my room. My wife wakes up, sees what's going on, hears me doing what I'm doing. She begins to plead the blood over me. But the thing went on, she says, usually when this happens to me, because it happens all the time, something coming after me. She'll plead the blood and it'll lift off of me. But this thing went on for a while and in the middle of it I knew when this thing had his hands out with these two symbols forecasting this spell against me that my praying in the spirit was stopping it from hitting me but it got so angry that lightning bolts came out of the thing you can hear the lightning just crashing a loud explosion in the room now this is the spirit world my, my wife is actually witnessing in the natural realm and warring against it over there while it's happening to me. And I wake up out of this thing. It's almost like, you, come, you know how you come out of that state when you're over there and this is happening to you. It's happened to a lot of different people the same way. When you're paralyzed, can't wake up. I can feel the energy of this conflict in my body. Like an electrical current going through me. And I woke up with that same energy flowing through me. Came out of it. And I, know, I knew that the the war has intensified. That's what I knew inside of me. Whatever's been happening has gone up a notch. So whatever you've been doing, you better go and fast. You better go and pray. You better get deep into your Bible and stay there. Because this thing is going up a notch. Because whatever this thing was, it was big. It was burly. And the reason why my wife drove that car into the lake or the river or the ocean, whatever it was, was because it's coming to kill now. Mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not here to tolerate anybody. The death angel from Satan has come to kill any straggling Christians that don't take it seriously. We better stop fooling around with this. We're against human beings who are in covenant with Satan to take over the world. You better know that. A lot of folks are practicing witches. And the a very anchor of a witch is this one thing. The reason why they control people. They cast spells. The reason why they lay down with people. And put sex witchcraft on them. They call it sex magic. It's one thing that anchors them to Satan. All I care about is myself. And what I want. Even if I have to go to hell. After I enjoy this life and what I want. Katy Perry tells you I cut a, I cut a covenant with the devil. She grew up in church singing religious songs, wanting to be Amy Grant. But it wouldn't get me the worship I wanted. It wouldn't get me to the Super Bowl halftime to be queen. If I got to die and go to hell to be something down here, I will. Mick Jagger, Rolling Stone, sings a song about the devil. 
sympathy for the devil. Bob Dylan tells you on a 60 minute interview, I got to pay the man that I made this agreement with. And the interviewer said, what, what man are you talking about? He said, you know the one. You know the one. It's people that have given themselves to Satan to enjoy the mansions and the Caribbean trips and the Lear jets and the private jets and the, and the sex parties and all the drugs they want, all the notoriety, all the fame and fortune. He offered Jesus to have the whole world in a moment in time if you'll just bow down and worship me. And multitudes of human beings have taken the offer. Some people are damned and cannot be saved. They serve Satan knowingly. There are women that have sex with Satan. He comes and he will actually incarnate himself. There are witches that have rituals to worship Satan for power. The quest in witchcraft is one thing and one thing only. Power. Power over other people. Power for me to be worshipped. Power. Some of you who are nominal Christians listening to me by live stream, you better wake up. You better wake up out of that drug-induced coma. The Bible calls it pharmakia. You're drugged with sorcery. You've been drugged by sorcery, divined upon by religion, and it's got you stagnant. You think it's something to play with. This thing is about to go up like an atomic bomb. 37 states, counting Alabama joining them, will be legalized in homosexual marriage. You get to 50, that means the whole United States is corrupted. The only other time this happened in history was Sodom and Gomorrah. A firestorm is on the way. Can't be abated. Can't get it stopped. God's judgment is set and it is sure. The best we can do is get as many people off the Titanic as we can. Because the ship has struck the iceberg. It's going down. Stop dreaming like it's something different than what it is. Millions of young women, middle-aged women, older women walking around will never get married because the guy's becoming homosexuals. The girl's almost stripping down butt naked. I think the devil's next move in society is public nudity. I really believe that. The women so naked now, they itching to get their clothes off. Kim Kardashian now, everywhere she takes a picture, she's butt naked. She just gave up and just stripped down. I got no singing ability. I got no acting ability. I got nothing I bring to the marketplace. You want to see my naked butt? That's what enthralls you. I'm just, giving, I'm just throwing in the towel. I'll just be everywhere butt naked. That's what the public wants. That's all I got. Go to a beach. I dare you. Modesty. Moderation. Plain old virtue, gone. It's crazy. All these, uh, uh, all these uh, spandex pants and these yoga pants is all about showing the, the public the woman's body by giving you an imaginary excursion into how I look naked with what I got on. I was in a school the other day and heard a teacher tell another teacher with these yoga pants on, skin tight. So uh, you decide to wear your underwear today. She said, yeah, I put them on today. Teachers talking about not wearing underwear with their yoga pants to make sure all the orifices of the body are playing the same. They design those things that even they, they'll go up into the, 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 the crevices of your body to outline your behind and your vagina and all that. So everybody, make sure everybody can see it. The cover of Sports Illustrated shows a girl shaving in a genital, genital, genital area, putting that swimsuit down right to where you almost right at the vagina. 
and stopping just short of it. But all of her pelvic area been shaved of all of her, her pubic hair to give you that thrill into almost seeing this girl naked. And she on the cover of Sports Illustrated thinking that's her big break. Stripped down as a harlot. You can't avoid it. It's at the checkout stand when you're leaving the store. Right there. Young people looking at it. Young kids looking at it. This is a world gone mad. Why is the girl naked on Sports Illustrated? She's practicing witchcraft. They're divining through her body to stimulate lust in men and women. Because a lot of women want these women now. You got married women who want other women now. They watch Carrie Washington and want Carrie Washington for themselves. They want Beyonce for themselves. They want to lay down with Rihanna. Because lust has no gender. When you divine lust through a body, it's going to hit males and females equally. It'll turn you into a lesbian and you won't even know what's got a hold on you. You think I'm crazy if you want to. You laugh at me if you want to. You mock it if you dare to. You better get yourself extracted from the, the devil and get your mind free because this clown is pulling up high intensity forces and this kind go of not out but by prayer and fasting. You better turn back to the old pathways of self-denial and living in your Bible, bathing your mind in songs, hymns, spiritual songs, and psalms. You better keep yourself inundated with God to build a fortress against the attack of the diviners of spells, sorcerers, folks that are coming, to slam into your soul and your mind and take it over. These are the masters of the game. These are people who are skilled at their sorcery and witchcraft. These are people who came from generations of witches. Their mother taught them what their grandmother taught their mother. Their great great grandmother taught their great their, their grandmother, etc., etc. These are generations of witches. Mama took her down to the root worker. We got a friend wanting to get married. Mama took her down, get some red oil from the root working woman, the witchcraft working woman. Spells to captivate a man, married to the man. He said the docile and anchored can't even move. Had a friend. Went over a woman's house committing adultery with the woman. She was married. He's slipping over there at night. See the woman. He in the middle of having sex with the woman in her bedroom. And her husband walks in. He thought he was dead. The lady gets up and said, Harry, go on back in the bedroom and shut your mouth and shut that door. He looked at the woman and said, that was your husband? She said, yeah, I got him under control. He don't bother me. I do what I want to do. He went back in the bedroom like a zombie. Couldn't say a word, couldn't do a thing about what she was doing. I said, man, what you better be worried about is what you just joined yourself to. I was in the Air Force with a guy dating a girl from Jamaica. He said, man, if people came over our house, and I got tired of people being over there. I was ready for them to leave. I just pop my finger and look at her. She goes to the door and turns the broom upside down. Everybody in the house had to get out. She'd make them leave. But she turned that broom upside down. I said, man, do you know what you were tapped into? All I know, she was fine. Fine? But you don't know what she put on you. The problems plague and a lot of you listening to me by way of the internet right now came from the witches and warlocks you join yourself to that put something on you that's now reaching through you to your kids even and turn them in, turning them into animals. You better get to God and get between that porch and that altar and lay yourself before God 
to come against the forces of the devil and stop fooling around with religion and playing with this. These are real forces. These are the end times and we're in the middle of an end game. Masters of the game are calling all, all bills due. You better get in this thing and play it for keeps this time because we don't have tomorrow to worry about. Whatever you're going to do, do it now because there's no time left. This is all about becoming a master of the game. Father, thank you for sharing these words with us, God. Cut us free from the devil. Bind the devil in the power of witchcraft, God. Be a swift witness against the witchcraft worker of the sorcerer. Reverse everything they divine and send forth. This stinking Grammy Awards. Curse it. Curse the movies that are coming out. This, this, this movie about, uh, uh, I think it's Jupiter's Arriving or something it's called. All this stuff about this girl being the queen of the, of the world and a, 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 a descendant of aliens. and All this stuff the devil's putting out here to try to bind the church. Forecast witchcraft. That filthy scandal show and empire and all that trash he's projecting into the, into the human soul. I curse it and reverse it all. God. Raise up a remnant of people that will be warriors against the devil's intrusion. Come against Jezebel and Ahab. A spellbound society, God. Break them free. Be a hammer against them. Make your people a battle axe to break the spells of the devil. Break the divination of the devil. Break the captivity of the human race. Destroy these yokes. The Bible says the yoke shall be taken from off of our necks because of the anointing. The anointing breaks this demonic yoke. Release us, God. Send your word and send your power to do it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. It's going to wrap it up with this week. Plan for keeps, folk. These are huge monolithic creatures coming forth now. Extraterrestrial beings are here. Laugh at it at your own expense. At your own demise, laugh your head off. Invisible, disembodied, metaphysical creatures. You better power up to overcome. Join us at the conference May 22nd through the 25th here in Atlanta. Register now, www.omegaministries.org. Give to the Dunamis Tabernacle Project. Listen to this, get up and contribute. Go to www.omegaministries.org. Hit support, then donate. Give the best that you can and keep giving. We're real. This is the end of an age. We're marshalling forces. We need a base camp for an army to train that army to stand against a metaphysical invasion. I wish it was Star Wars. I wish it was a movie. I wish it was Star Trek. I wish it was make believe. This ain't a fairy tale, folks. These are real entities. We got to make a stand for God, get full of the word, get full of God's spirit, and stand. Having done all to stand, stand therefore, armor clad and ready for war. Support the objective. This ain't the same old church mess. We want to equip you and people like you to do the, do the work of the ministry yourself. www.omegaministries.org. Click support, donate. Don't procrastinate. That's the power of darkness. Get up. Break free from that thing. Let's do this in Jesus' name. See you back here next week. Wednesday night Bible study 730. Be blessed. Stay out of all works of darkness. Stay away from everything evil. And for God's sake, stay out of the devil's matrix. Be blessed. Love everybody. Have a good week.